Hi, educators. I'm so glad to be back with you today for Live at Five. I am excited to talk to you about our topic today. Um, so how many of you have ever tried to put together small group time in your classroom? Whether you're a kindergarten teacher or you're a ninth grade English language arts teacher, um, you just struggle to figure out how in the world to make that work within the time that you actually have with kids. Well, I'm here to share some strategies with you so that you know how to set up your small groups in your classroom. Now you might be thinking, Diane, I have some small groups set up, but I just can't make them work for me. Just stick with me, and at the end of this broadcast, I'm going to be sharing with you some next steps steps on what to do once you have kids in your groups. So um, for the sake of our conversation today, I'm going to talk about um, small groups in an elementary setting, but that does not mean that it's exclusive. So I'll give you some crossovers for those of you that teach older grades as well and how you can make small groups work. I'm Diane McKinley, and I have been in education for over 20 years. I have been a classroom teacher, a writing coach, an administrator, and worked for the Indiana Department of Education in the Office of School Turnaround. And I'm excited to share some strategies with you today that I have used in my classroom for many, many years. Now, I'm going to start off with a bonus tip. I like to give bonus tips for those of you who join me right away um, so that you can hear you know, all of the best of everything and then a little, some, a little something extra. So I'm going to share with you my bonus tip first. And the bonus tip is focused around how in the world you decide which kids go in groups to begin with. So what I want you to do is I want you to make sure that you're using multiple sources of data. You never want to use just one measure with your data because that's not going to give you a really clear picture of where your kids are. So as I mentioned, I'll give some examples examples of some um, elementary literacy pieces. So if I were um, in a K-6 setting and I were going to be making small groups during my literacy time, um, I would want to look at several sources of data. So I might use things um, like Dibbles for fluency, but I might also use a DRA kit, which is a developmental reading assessment, or a Fontes and Pinnell kit to figure out reading level as well. So I was also looking at um, the student's comprehension. So there are tons of ways that you can do this. You can use NWEA scores, you can use STAR scores, whatever your system typically uses, um, whatever your school system uses um, will be great. Just make sure you don't have just one measure. You really need to have multiple measures. So that's our bonus tip. You're gonna wanna make sure you at least triangulate your data um, so that you're looking at multiple measures um, for your groups. So let's hop right in then to step number one. Very simple step number one. You might wanna grab a piece of paper and a pencil, but with step number one, you're gonna wanna to write down the total number of students you have in your classroom. For some of you, this is the biggest stumbling block. This is where you get stuck. You say, oh my gosh, Diane, I have 30 kids in my class. I can't possibly do small groups. Well, I'm going to share with you how you can do that. So write down your number. So whatever your number is, if it's, you know, 16, haha, wish we were that lucky, or if it's all the way up to 30 plus, write down the number of students that you have in your class. And then I want you to divide that number by five. So for the sake of um, an example, I'm going to pretend like I have 30 kids in my class, and if I divide that number by five, voila, I get six. That means that I am going to have six groups of students. Why did you do that, Diane? Well, uh, we divided it by five because you typically want to have between four and six students within a group. No more than six, um, and you can have fewer than four, but it just gets hard to manage when you have that many students in a classroom. So if I had six groups and five kids in each group, that would give me my 30 kids. So very first thing is you just want to figure out about how many groups you're going to have. In a minute, I'll show you how to manipulate the four to six. So once you have number two, you can move on to step two, you know how many groups you're gonna have. Uh, then you're gonna start to assign students to those groups based upon the data that you've collected. So going back and looking at that data, you're gonna decide who goes into the first group, the second group, the third group, and so on. Now, this is where those numbers come into play. So if I have students who um, are um, at the lower end of my, um, my assessments and I really want to make sure that I can help them along the way and give them some more individualized attention, um, in that case, I would, I would uh, skew those numbers down to like four and pop one of those kids into another. So I might have one group of four and another group of six and the rest of mine groups of five. Um, so you would be able to you know, decide that on your own. Um, typically, those students who are doing very well, those, that's when you want to have those larger groups like six, and the kids who are struggling more, you want to have four. Remember that when you're creating groups, these are not fixed groups. These are groups that you want to make sure are fluid throughout the year. 
that as you keep constantly reassessing your students, you're able to move them in and out of groups based upon whatever skills you happen to be working on at the time. And as we know, when you're doing pre-assessments, some kids are going to excel in some areas and struggle in others. So they will move back and forth between those groups and they'll move as you continue to accelerate their learning for them. So that's step two, decide who goes in which group. When we're looking at step number three, we want to decide about the amount of time. So when we're looking at the amount of time, if you are in the younger grades, um, so you're looking at K through three or even K through six, um, you typically have a 90 minute reading block. And so if you're using a workshop model, you want to make sure that 60 of those minutes are going to go towards your small group time. That gives you plenty of time to do your warm up, your, um, your mini lesson and then you're closing at the end if you're doing a true workshop model. So that gives you five minutes for warm up, 15 minutes for your mini lesson and another 10 minutes there at the end for your closing, which will give you that other 30 minutes in your 90 minute reading block. If you're thinking, I don't have 90 minutes because I am, you know, a seventh grade math teacher. No worries. You can adjust that as well. So if you typically have a 55 minute or 60 minute class period, um, then you would want to spend about 30 minutes in your groups. Another option for that is um, for those of you in those grades seven through 12, you could look at doing um, a few days a week where you're doing small groups. Small groups are so, so important to the success of your students, whether um, no matter what end they're on. If they're at the very low end, if they're in the middle, if they're at the very high of any of their skills, they really need that extra time to get in there and dig in to work with their peers and to also have an assistance from um, also have assistance from the teacher, from you, so that they can have some some additional support along the way. So um, you can skew that, change that up a little bit for you, whether you are in upper grades or whether you're in lower grades. Okay, moving on to step number four. So what you want to think about is you want your groups to be about 15 to 20 minutes in length. That means if you're doing a 60 minute block that you're going to rotate every, or you're going to rotate every 15 or 20 minutes, which means you could have um, four groups during a day or you could have three groups during a day. So if you're thinking back to how many groups you had, if you had six groups, that would mean that you're going to do a little bit of an adjustment. And you're going to say, okay, with six groups, I can't see all of them in one hour. That would be crazy 10-minute groups that would be shuffling around and be really hard to manage. So instead, you're going to space them out. And you're going to say, I'm going to meet with this group on Monday and Wednesday and Friday. And this, these groups on Tuesday and Thursday. Or you can rotate them day A, day B. Um, what I always did was the students who had the most significant need, um, those that were scoring lowest on my assessment pieces, um, I would see them every single day. And those who scored higher, typically my gifted kids or my high achieving kids, I wouldn't see them as often, not because they didn't need just as much um, assistance, but because they could do a lot of those pieces um, once I got them in the right direction, even more so on their own. And they got to continue to dig in and get into those, um, those deeper depths of knowledge um, assignments that we were working on. So they had more extended period of time that they could work without me interrupting them while they were going. Um, and I was doing a lot more hands-on with those kids who needed more assistance. So that was step number four, if you're counting. We're on step number five now. Here's the biggie. Train, train, train. It is so very important that you are making sure that your kids know how to do small groups before you ever let them actually do small groups. So you're going to make sure that if you're with the younger kids, you're only introducing one or two small group independent pieces at a time. And with the older kids, it can be more than that, but you're going to make sure that you don't do too many. So you want to be able to show them how to do it, um, get them through the process before you ever go and sit down and start working with a small group yourself. They need to know exactly what to do, who to ask questions for. Hint, hint, it's not you unless there's an emergency because you're trying to work um, in an intense group on your own. Um, so they need to know where to go to find information if they can't come to you. Um, and then they need to know how to clean up and move to a new station when it's time. And so it's so important that you practice that and practice that. Here's a hint for you. If you're with the younger kids, you can use um, some really simple strategies with them to um, kind of train them through and let them know exactly what to do in that situation. You can have some great anchor charts on the wall that let them know what to do if they um, get stuck and need help. Um, with the older kids, you can assign some peer buddies that can help um, get people unstuck while they're um, in their groups. And then the other part is once they know what to do, it is also imperative that you train them on how to transition. So transitions um, need to be really quick and fast. They need to happen like a snap um, because 
as we said, we might only have 60 minutes or 30 minutes and we're going to be transitioning to a new um, station or center or small group. And we want to make sure that we utilize that time really wisely. And so for the younger kids, you could use something as simple as a rhyme. Two, four, six, eight. Now it's time to rotate. And you would practice that before you ever actually plan on having a group in the back by yourself or at a table by yourself or, or wherever you're going to position yourself. Otherwise, they're going to interrupt you constantly or when it's time to transition, they're not going to make those smooth transitions and you're going to get all discombobulated and not able to stay on track. So um, the older kids, you can use something really fun, like some type of great music that they might like. So you play the music and as the music starts to play, um, they know that it's time to quickly clean and move to their next um, small group so that they know what they're going to do when they get there. So I gave you a bonus tip at the beginning. If you joined us later on, please go back and watch that bonus tip and then steps one through five for you to get your small groups going. Now, if you were waiting all the way to the end to find out what do I do once I have the group set up, I have got a special treat for you. I have a friend, Cheryl Petrasky, who is going to be doing a session on January 5th and January 10th from 7 to 8 p.m. You can go and sign up for that session. The session is called Loving My Literacy Block, where you can join in and find out amazing things that you can do during your literacy block that will really help propel your students forward. Um, you can join us on um, by going to our website and joining on that link. It is www.incompassing.com forward slash lounge dash learn. Look for 11 My Literacy Block there. It's Encompassing Education or EncompassingEd.com forward slash lounge dash learn. We hope to see you there and I hope you have a great night.